what we're talking about here, as we're going through the book of Revelation, we're all we're, we're nearing the end of the book, all right? And so this is like the end of the end uh, that's happening here. And so uh, the problem is 16, 17, 18, 19, all those chapters I feel are kind of running together. And so it's really, really difficult for me to, to get it all into this one uh, neat kind of a sermon or something. So I'm going to do the best I can to talk about this idea of Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is kind of a popular word in our society for those who might want to write a book on end times prophecy or, or movies. Uh, just out of curiosity, to kind of put my finger on the pulse uh, of society on this subject, I looked up on Google Armageddon, and what came up is a movie. There was a movie by the name of Armageddon, and uh, really, I think the word that they were looking for was maybe apocalypse because it really didn't have anything to do with Armageddon. <laughs> okay, but maybe apocalypse or thinking like end times or something like that. Uh, but really, the typically people don't understand what Armageddon is. Christians, we might have some different uh, ideas about that. But really, there's not a whole lot in the Bible about this battle of Armageddon, except in this chapter. And the name Ar Armageddon uh, apparently means the hill of Megiddo. So it's a reference to another place that is used in the Bible a couple places. And historically, if you go and you look at the battles, the historic like epic battles that were fought in this uh, valley of, of Megiddo, there were some pretty significant ones throughout history. And uh, even uh, more recently, World War I, I accidentally wrote World War II down there, but it's World War I where they had a, a, a very important battle there and uh, called the Battle of Megiddo. And I'm sure a lot of people at that point thought, oh, here we are. This is the end, you know, but this is uh, this is the idea of the hill of Megiddo. And from what I, what I understand, that area, when they say hill, it's not like a mountain or like a, a natural hill that's there, but it's just years and years of building upon the same uh, surface. So it's a little bit elevated. Uh, again, I don't know exactly, but here's whether it's significant where the place is in the Middle East, the exact location or significant about things that happened there throughout history or even in the Bible. Uh, one thing we know is that a, the Megiddo means a place, uh, apparently it means the place of crowds, the place of crowds. So you know, every time it's used, Megiddo or Armageddon, which means the hill of Megiddo is talking about a, a place of crowds, which makes sense uh, in, this, in this battle that we're going to see. So uh, here's a couple places in the Old Testament where it's used. This is where uh, Josiah died. If you remember, Josiah was a good king, tried to turn the people back to God. God basically said, it's too late. I'm glad you have a good heart and you're doing right and you're weeping for the nation. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, the, don't try to fight the battle. And, of course, he goes and he tries to fight the battle anyway, and he ends up dying right there in the Valley of Megiddo. And uh, also, there's a place where uh, Deborah and Barak sing a song. And in that song, excuse me, got like a piece of paper or something in my mouth. <laughs> in that song, they talk about Megiddo. Now, it's, uh, there's some say that that's prophetic about what we're reading about in Revelation. I don't know. Uh, but there's, there's a few places where it's used. And then, like I said, throughout history, there have been some other significant battles uh, in that area. So now when we get to chapter 16, uh, we began seeing all these, uh, these vile judgments that are poured out. These are the judgments of God upon the earth. And just as a reminder, we've already talked about uh, the judgments when we were going through the uh, trumpet judgments. And I showed how these are very, very similar. They, they have a lot in common with these uh, judgments because... Uh, you know, after chapter 12, we're kind of seeing the whole story again from a different perspective. And, uh, and we can see that when these judgments are, are taking place, you know, however they, they happen, maybe there's the vile judgment, I mean, the uh, trumpet judgment is first, and then later the vile judgment, or maybe they're kind of like the same thing, kind of looking at it from different perspectives. I don't really know, but these, these are all the wrath of God being poured out. He has seven angels, and, they'll, and they have something that they're, they're um, putting onto the earth or different places where they pour their vials. We'll look at some of those. 
And uh, anyway, we went through the, those judgments a little bit more in detail. And of course, these things happen after God's people or the elect or the saints, whatever you want to call those who are believers, are taken out into the rapture. Okay, And so right after that, and uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll come back to this thought or not, but right after we're taken out, and this is very consistent in the Bible, right after God's people are taken out, the judgment of God begins. And so what we see is God's judgment being poured out. We've already looked uh, through some different things here. And so now, as God pours out His wrath, uh, we see right away these different vials. The first went, it says in verse 2, poured out His vial upon the earth. There fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men that had the mark of the beast. Again, these are people that are still here on the earth after the rapture, and these are the ones who accepted the beast, and, the, and it, spe, uh, it specifies that they are the ones that are going to have the wrath poured out against them. They've been persecuting the saints, and, uh, and they've been doing wickedly, worshiping false images, and uh, failing to repent. Even though God's going to pour out all this wrath on them, they still continue uh, to, uh, to, to do those things. All right, second angel, verse 3, pours out his vial on the sea, and it became, it became as the blood of a dead man. Kind of makes you think about the plagues on Egypt. You know, when Moses uh, turns the water into blood, every living soul died in the sea. A third angel poured his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the, uh, of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and west and shall be, because thou have has judged us. And that's a, another reoccurring theme as God pours out His wrath. We would look at that and say, oh, how awful people are dying. Oh, how awful God's pouring out His judgment. But no, actually what He's doing is justified. You know? And we have to uh, understand that in our glorified body, we're going to be made perfect. We're going to recognize God as being perfect. And as we see His judgment upon sin, we're going to say, well, that's justified. And we're actually going to rejoice with him each step of the way. And you see that he shows you the saints there uh, saying, uh, you know, blessed, blessed be the Lord. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, verse 7, I heard another out of the altar uh, say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Then there's a fourth angel, pours his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And uh, men were scorched with great heat that blaspheme the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Then we see the fifth angel pours out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and, uh, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongue for pain, and blasphemed God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not. You think instead of blaspheming God, they'd say, okay, God, what do you, what do you want us to do? You know, we'll stop, we'll stop doing these things, but they don't. They consider him as their enemy. And they keep going against them all the way up to the very end. Finally, the sixth angel pours out his vial. This is verse 12 on the great river Euphrates. And notice this, the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Okay, so here's what I think is going on. He's going to dry up that spot. Now the kings of the east are able to come to this location that we're going to talk about where, the, uh, where Armageddon is going to be. All right, now here's a really interesting uh, verse, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now that reminds me of a plague too. Remember the plague of frogs? <laughs> right? that's, the only, uh, that's the only symbolism I can think of because you would think unclean beasts, frogs, where else do we see that in the Bible? I don't know. All I know is that frogs are slimy and uh, they're, they're unclean animals in the Bible. And he, these, he somehow sees these spirits. Now, a spirit, uh, it might be, you know, I'm trying to think of like whenever the, the Holy Spirit comes upon, uh, you, you know, comes upon the apostles like a, like a cloven tongue, you know, like a flaming fire. Sometimes we see that. I don't know. It could be just something that was totally not even a, not even a, a, a physical substance that you could touch. But as he sees this come out in this vision, he sees it come out like frogs. All right. And here's what it says. Out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. We talked about these individuals. The dragon, of course, is Satan himself. And then he's got what we call the Antichrist, who's this world leader. Beast also representing that nation that's rising up. But then there's a leader over that nation, like the Bible will often talk about Nebuchadnezzar, 
uh, in reference to all of Babylon or something like that. And so, uh, and so this is the case. <laughs> and so the first thing that we want to look at here about Armageddon, okay, is when does this event happen? And notice it happens, it doesn't happen until that sixth, uh, that sixth angel pours out his vial. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It, talks, it happens when the seventh angel uh, pours out his vial. So let's go to the seventh angel. I want to skip the 14, 15, 16. I'm a, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. In verse 17, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of God from the throne, saying, It is done. And so you would look at that and you would say, What do you mean it is done? Uh, there's still a whole lot that goes on in the next few chapters in case you didn't know that. What do you mean it is done? And the first thing that went through my mind is Jesus on the cross. Whenever Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's about to give up the ghost, he says, it is finished, right? But didn't he not still have to go to hell for three days, right? Descend into hell for three days and then raise from the dead, right? All these things were still going to happen. So when he says, it is finished, what does he mean? Well, you could say that like the, the very end, the last thing that he had to do upon this earth was done, right? So I see a similarity there whenever he pours out his last, the last plague or the last uh, judgment, if you will. And he says, he pours it on the air, verse 17. He poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple and the throne saying, it is done. Okay, and then we're going to see what that, what that, what happens in that plague. Now, I don't want to go to those verses yet. I, I really want to spend some time on that here in a second. So let's look at, uh, let's compare this to chapter ten. Now remember, chapter twelve, we're kind of reading some of these events again. So I'm going to go backwards, but we're talking about the same event, I believe. Revelation chapter tw uh, ten. Look at verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, all right, so all we've read about at this point was up to the sixth angel, and it says, uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, and he hath declared to his, as he hath declared to his servants and his prophets. Now, in this first telling of these end time events, uh, we're kind of interrupted with chapter 11 and it talks about the two witnesses and, uh, and all in, it's like, okay, what, ha what is that seventh, you know, judgment? We don't, it doesn't seem as clear as we continue to read this. Uh, and in fact, it says, you know, two woes are past and there's one more woe, uh, to come and you're, you're reading along saying, well, what is that woe? It's not super clear. Till you get to verse 19, it does talk about the lightnings and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. But it seems like compared to all these other judgments, how is that such a terrible woe? That you, you know. Uh, so when you compare that to chapter 17, which uh, chapter 16, which we just read, uh, you will see uh, uh, more similarities. Now you're still in chapter 10. Look at verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. But wait a minute. He had, it hasn't all happened yet. That's all this, the judgments and the, the things to come. We still have a little bit more that's going on. But he says here that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And so I see like it's kind of the same theme where he's, it hasn't actually played out yet. But it's like it has, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like if you I don't watch a whole lot of sports. OK, but let's say you're into that and you record the football game. Right now, perhaps you already know that your team won. Maybe you already know some details, you know, maybe it's something that you've seen before. But you sit down and you watch this recording and you're really into football and you get into it and you're watching it again and you know this pass is coming up but you're watching it all over again, you understand? So these events in the Bible are already recorded. Certain things are already gonna take place. We know that they're gonna take place. We can go back to Daniel 
chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and see the same things that are going to take place. Uh, we know they're going to happen. Uh, but here, as they're being played out, you see the angels are rejoicing every step of the way. And as soon as that last plague is pointed, I mean, look, before any of the, any of the judgments even happen, they're in heaven singing songs. Uh, we just talked about, I think it was last week, we talked about the song of Moses and the song of the, uh, uh, of the Lamb. And they're singing songs like, hey, we've won the victory. And you're thinking, well, there's still some more left, right? But in their mind, it's like, hey, we've already, this last step has, been, has taken place. Time to rejoice, time to get excited. And I think that's kind of what keeps happening. Before this battle of Armageddon, we even read about it, we see a celebration, if you will. Okay, and so when does it happen? It happens right after the last seal is poured out. And I believe that some of that judgment takes place during, like kind of like Armageddon is uh, part of that judgment. Okay, so basically what happens is they're all going to be gathered together for just one last whooping. <laughs> right? They're all going to be gathered together to one spot, all the kingdoms of this night. Now, if you just got done reading chapter 11, let's go up to chapter 11. Again, we reset after chapter 12 and we begin telling the story again. But at the end of this, when you get to chapter 11, <clears throat> you saw the two witnesses. And the two witnesses are slain and they're dying in the, and they're dead in the streets of Jerusalem. Okay, it makes it clear that it's talking about Jerusalem. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, of course, the whole world is watching them, which is pretty significant prophecy considering... Back then, we would have wondered how the whole world could be watching. Now we know because we have cell phones and TVs and, and all the computers. And so we know that, how they're watching them. But they're watching as the two witnesses lay dead in the street. They're giving gifts to one another because they're excited about it because they think that they've won. Uh, but obviously, we know that, that, that they haven't won. Their, their end is already uh, in the books. Okay, And so then God gives power to the witnesses. They rise back up. And then you see here, this is just a small group that's in Jerusalem. Look at verse 13, chapter 11, verse 13. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. That's the city of Jerusalem. And in that earthquake was slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now it doesn't say that they got saved. Now, I'm not going to say nobody gets saved when the wrath of God's poured out. I'm, I, what I have said before is I don't see it, okay? After the rapture, I don't see where people are getting saved. But what it does say is that they gave glory to the God of heaven. And the way I interpret this is basically they're seeing all these things happen. They saw the two witnesses rise up from the dead, and they finally say, like, mercy, you know, like, like okay, you got me, you got me, I surrender. All right? That doesn't mean they got saved. That just means they're no longer fighting at this point. I think later on they're going to, uh, as, we, as, in the, as we read that in the context. But anyway, uh, there is a small minority there that is kind of spared at that point before all these end, th end time th uh, things happen. But for the most part, everybody's going to be gathered together. And the Bible says it's going to be kings and all the people, you know, kind of like their armies and, and all the influential people are going to be met together, where I talked about how he dried up the Euphrates River so that they can, they can travel over there, however they're traveling, and they can come uh, to this great battle. All right, now who is the one who's gathering them, them there? Let me read this to you, and this is very confusing. This is the part where I'm saying, I still need more time to figure this one out. And if you know, please let me know, uh, because it's confusing to me. But I'll, I'll read these to you, I'll give you some thoughts, and I'll tell you what I, what I think is going on. Back to chapter 16. Revelation 16. Let me just start with 13 again and read this whole section. <clears throat> Oops, 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So you got three of them coming out. <clears throat> For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them uh, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Let's stop there. Uh, so these demons are somehow going to produce miracles and people are going to be deceived. We see that over and over. Matthew 24, Jesus warns of that. Many will be deceived. 
Uh, they'll come and they'll perform miracles and everybody say, wow, look, they, you know, they are who they say that they are. And they'll, they'll, that'll cause them to want to worship them. Uh, and so that's why we got to be careful not to be deceived. If somebody starts saying that they have the ability to perform certain miracles or whatever, well, look, you know, all I know is the Bible says you got to be wary about the signs and the wonders that will deceive people. And, uh, and so we got to be careful about that. But these uh, demons that come out, or these devils, if you will, they come out and they're deceiving the world. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Look at this again. Verse 13. It's talking about these demons or devils, whatever you want to call them. For, that, uh, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth uh, unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now here's where it gets tricky. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. All right, so let's stop there. So we talked about these devils, the frogs, if you will. They're like frogs. And it's saying that they did these miracles and, uh, and deceived everybody to, to gather them to the battle of the great day. So if I stopped right there and asked you, who's gathering all the people together? You would say the spirits of the devils, right? That's what it says that they're doing. But then it says, behold, I come as a thief. Now, who does that make you think of? And he says, I, right? And if you have a red letter Bible, it's probably red, right? Which I know that's not necessarily inspired, but I'm just saying somebody decided that this is the words of Christ. Uh, but it makes sense. I come as a thief. Now, if we look up, uh, if we look up, hold your place there and look at Luke. We just recently talked about this in Luke 18. Jesus gives a parable. Luke 18, look at verse 7. He says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, but cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And when I talked about this, I pointed out that in, in the previous chapter, uh, he's actually talking about the, day, uh, the days of Lot and the days of uh, Noah. And he talks about the coming of the Son of Man, right? The, the days of, of the Son of God. And so, uh, and so what he says here in, in, in uh, Luke 18 is he's given a parable about a lady who's, who's just keeps talking to the judge and asking, will you avenge me of my enemy? Will you avenge me of my enemy? And finally he says, fine, I'll do it. And then he says, if the unjust judge will, uh, will do that, he says, how much more shall not God, verse 7, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? And so we know that that's probably a reference to the time of the tribulation when God's people are being persecuted and they're crying out to him. And we have record in, in Revelation 6 where they're saying, how long you know, shall uh, you not avenge us? And then he says, I tell you uh, that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh. Uh, so in chapter 7, he says, though he bear long. And then it says he will avenge them speedily. Well, he's not saying that he's going to avenge them as soon as they ask him to. It's just whenever he does come to give vengeance, it's going to happen speedily. All right, so now back to Revelation. So I think that is probably talking definitely about, about Jesus, and he's saying, hey, he comes as a thief. Now, they don't exactly know when he's coming, what he's going to do. Now, uh, a little confused about this, but it does say, Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And it reminded me of when... Uh, Matthew 24, uh, he says, you know, those who are fleeing, don't look back to take stuff with you and, uh, and you know, and woe unto those who are with child and all these inconveniences. And it's almost like he's saying, look, you know, I'm coming back as a thief. And if you're not ready, I mean, if you're caught like in your underwear, you, <laughs> you know, that's going to be a shame. You don't have time to put clothes on. It's too late. This has already come. But I'm not completely sure uh, what that has to do uh, with Armageddon. But again, we talked about the spirit of devils who are gathered. It says that to gather them to the battle of the great day of the Lord Almighty. 
then all of a sudden we have what I believe, and you apparently believe, that it's Jesus. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Verse 16, And he gathered them together into one place, called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, who is it talking about? <laughs> well, there's a couple possibilities. Are we When it says he, are we talking about that, sixth, that seventh angel? Uh, sixth angel, I'm sorry that it just was talking about a few minutes ago in uh, verse 12? Is it talking about those devils? But if it's talking about those devils gathering them together, why does it say he? The only possibility I can think of is like whenever uh, uh, the guy is possessed with the devils and it says, it says uh, I'm legion, right? Which, which is like one voice, one person representing a multitude. I don't think that's probably it, though. I think it's talking about Jesus. So here's what I want to uh, throw out there as my kind of hypothesis if you will okay i think and i've preached messages on this in this in this series where it showed that when god pours out his wrath it's typically he's using his angels he's using messengers he's using somebody to do something and sometimes it's demons sometimes god uses the devil or sometimes god will use a reprobate person who's possessed with the devil or something like that and he'll use them for his purposes to work out his, you know these are ministers but they're doing the minister of ministry of the Lord. And you think, well, why would God allow that to happen? Well, how about Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar, he specifically said that he's my servant. I'm using him. Uh, sometimes it calls it Nebuchadnezzar's sword, and sometimes it calls it God's sword, if you read Ezekiel. And, uh, and it's like, hey, this is God's hand, but he's using other people to do this. So it's whatever the case, these people are being gathered together at Armageddon. OK, this big for this big final uh, destruction of all the people that are there. And I don't exactly know how they're being taken there. But it's really interesting that that just uh, yesterday somebody shared a message. I can't remember the guy's name. It's something Yankee. You ever heard of that? Or is it first name or last name Yankee? I can't remember. I just that just, name just kind of stuck out at me. But anyway, he's an, old, he's an older preacher. He's got some good messages out there. And uh, but he preached a thing. I never heard this before. And I'm, I don't I don't buy it, but I but this is what his his theory was, and he has to be talking about this this place right here. But he was saying that you know when the when Jesus says I come as a thief in the in the night, and when it says you know two will be in the field, one will be uh, left behind, the other will be taken. Well, he says that's not the rapture. I believe it is in the context whenever you read that. But he says no no no. This is then. Of course he's he believes in pre pre trib, so he's. You know, he's got to use that into his calculations. But he believes that what that is talking about is is God, Christ is actually snatching them away to bring them to the Armageddon, which I think is kind of weird. Like there's two in the field and then all of a sudden, whoa, no, I on the battlefield <laughs> for, you know, but I, I, I don't know where that came from. But I thought it was really weird that I was studying this out a little bit confused. And then I heard him say that. And so I'm like, this must be where he got that. Uh, but if you've studied this out, you got some ideas. I'd love to hear them. I'm going to study this some more, hopefully. Hopefully next week I can uh, maybe correct any mistakes I might have made here. All right. But uh, he said, I come as a thief. Now look at uh, chapter 11 again. Again, talking about the same thing. We're just backing up and, and referring to the first telling of, this, uh, of these events. Chapter 11, verse 14. Now, remember, I, I made reference to this verse earlier. He talks about this third woe that's coming, and then you never really hear what that woe is. And so later on, when you get to chapter 16, chapter 17, you kind of say, okay, this is what that seventh is and what the woe is. But here's what he says in verse 14. He says, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly, okay, or speedily, you know, in like a idea that when to cast out his final judgment, it's going to be swift. Now, here's another thought. What happens at the uh, Battle of Armageddon? You would think, okay, well, Battle of Armageddon, Jesus comes, and Jesus whips up on everybody. But that doesn't seem to be exactly how it happens. Now, we'll talk uh, more next week, Lord willing, about the uh, Mystery Babylon, because that's chapter 17, and I want to just do that whole chapter together. But... Look at chapter 17, uh, and we'll just read a couple verses from there, starting in verse 14. Revelation 17, 14. 
And again, I think this is all talking about that same time period there. But he says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And uh, they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, who would be with the Lord and who would be called faithful and chosen? I think there's two possibilities. One would be all the saints, but the other possibility is 144,000, right? Remember, whenever he comes back, chapter 14 talks about it, and chapter 7 talks about it when he comes uh, and he's got his army uh, with him, okay? And so, uh, uh, so then he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest were uh, where the whore sitteth, I'll talk about the great whore next week, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. All right, they were all coming together into the, the battle. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the wor uh, words of God shall be fulfilled. Now, here's what I'm thinking as I'm reading this. Uh, again, we'll talk more about it next week. Hopefully, I'll, I'll see if I'm making some mistakes on this. But here's what I'm thinking. You remember reading about all these wars in the Old Testament where they didn't even have to fight? <laughs> People in the uh, you know Jericho, you know, they're just like turning on each other. Canaan, you know, different places in Canaan. Uh, they're just like, they didn't really have to do it. Maybe the people were just confused because it was dark and they're killing each other or they hear a great noise and, and oh no, they freak out and they're killing each other. Like a lot of times God would just allow people to turn on each other. And it looks like maybe this is what's going on. All of a sudden they don't like uh, the beast, you know, they don't like the woman, uh, the great whore, if you will. And I, uh, again, I don't want to get too much into that. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, so it seems like at, at least at first, Jesus isn't even necessarily doing that. Now look at chapter 18, verse 17. Or let's see here. Let's just start with verse 16. And saying, Alas, alas, the great, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors and, uh, and as many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and they cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein, uh, were much, uh, uh, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. Now, I don't know if that's a literal hour. Uh, I tried to figure out if we're talking about a seven-year period, and uh, we already know that the seven-year period is, is, uh, is called a week, you know, like seven days. And so I'm just trying to get, like, creative. And I'm like, well, how much would that be then? How much would an hour be? And uh, I don't know. Maybe it's talking about a literal hour. Uh, if you work out the math on what I was just saying, that'd be like 15 days. I don't know if that's significant or not. Uh, but you see, it's a short time. All the, you know, uh, glory of this place or, or this whole system, if you will, okay, the great whore and all this, all of the, uh, the, 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 their luxuries and their delicacies and all over uh, are all over in one hour. All right. Now, then uh, we get to chapter 19. And now this is when I believe Christ appears, right, to receive his kingdom. But before he receives his kingdom, he's got one last thing to do. Chapter 19, verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now look back at chapter 1. Revelation 1, 16. When John sees this image of Christ, you know, he sees his hair is white, his feet are like fine brass. And then it says he had in his right hand, verse 16, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. 
uh, in his strength. And so there's reference, this is the same reference to that. This is Jesus coming, and he's got this sword proceeding out of his mouth. Now, I've talked about the fact that that's probably a sim something that's kind of symbolic, or maybe not. Maybe I made reference to the uh, cherubims in the, in the Garden uh, of Eden and how they protected, and there was a sword that went every which way. And I'm like, maybe there's a literal type of a sword that proceeds from out of his mouth. It doesn't say like... Because I used to picture that in my mind, like he's just got this real long tongue that's like made out of metal and it's sharp on both ends. <laughs> Man, it's just a sword that just goes out from his mouth and just does whatever he tells it to do, you know? Uh, I don't know, but it seems like this is the time Christ finally comes and, uh, and he finally just basically totally an annihilates uh, who's left there at that battle. And then that ushers in the kingdom, which we'll talk about that in chapter 20 and 21. Good grief, man. There's a lot there, and uh, it's kind of, a, kind of hard to preach. But here is, here is the good news. Okay, you ready? If you're saved, if you're a child of God, none of this even... <laughs> I don't want to say it doesn't matter. It matters. It's in the Word of God. We want to, we want to consider the whole uh, counsel of God. But it won't matter to you. You know what I'm saying? You won't have to go through uh, these battles. You certainly aren't going to fight against the Lord. You're going to be on the Lord's side. And so, uh, and so the most important thing at this time period is that we understand that we're saved, we're children of God, and then we go out and try to reach others for the gospel of Christ. And, and so uh, anyway, as we're studying through this book of Revelation, sometimes it kind of gets overwhelming. Uh, but it's in there. There's a blessing to those who study this and read it. Uh, but we we just want to always remember, I'm so glad I'm saved and I don't have to endure the wrath of God. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And, uh, and we certainly do read these things and recognize your power. And, uh, and it helps us to fear you like we should. We don't fear uh, losing our salvation. Those who are saved, uh, we, we have full assurance that we are sealed. Uh, by the Holy Spirit into the day of redemption. No man can pluck us out of your hands. We understand that. But we do fear your power and what you could do to us should we get out of line or turn from you and, 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 uh, and backslide or whatever and how the ch your chastening hand uh, is so powerful. We cannot fight against you. And so as we look at the different judgments and your wrath, uh, we, uh, it should move us to fear and trembling, Lord. And I pray that you'll help us to fear, fear you in the proper way and uh, help it to motivate us to serve you and work for you, not for our salvation, but to make you happy, glorify you, and then to seek rewards that we know will come. Uh, so we continue to lay up treasures in heaven and serve you, that you be honored and glorified. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.